Hey guys, it has been a little bit, a little, little. I'm still doing videos on every single quarterfinal matchup, and today we are going to talk about Cloud9 because that's a, that's a, that's a good time. That 3-0, that made me, that made me look dumb. Habits. But uh, since I believe in paying dues, this title is a bit of a callback to the video I made about Cloud9 at the play-in, because I feel like if the plan made C9 look bad, which by the way, I wasn't really that committal about my answer there, I just said, yeah, yeah kind of, but these are all fixable things, and, and they were, they were very fixable. But I think it's only fair that I turn it around and say, how good did quarterfinals make C9 look? <laughs> They, they look pretty good, but specifically discussing certain aspects of win conditions, and that's why we're going to go ahead and take a look at game two and uh, effectively how we got here. Flash forward, caught Mowgli, but he didn't turn him back on. This time's gonna mean he cannot find Jensen, and if there was second kill with a jungler dead, this could be a lot. Curl gonna jump the wall, and he's flashless, and it's gonna be Sneaky jumping over. He'll find the stun. He's got reinforcements. Three straight kills for Cloud9. This is a great game to talk about because I am a big fan of saying that the game isn't all about draft. And I think it's, it's not too surprising to say I kind of hate Cloud9's draft a little bit. Matchup wise, it's it's not super good. You have a losing top lane, you have a mid lane that's a bit of a skill matchup. Obviously Ari can do some stuff if she hits her charm, but Ari is just not the greatest champion ever. And Ryze has a on-click stun, so Ryze plus Sin Zhao is actually a really good 2v2 combo into, Ra into Graves. Ari, in my opinion, because yes, you have the burst damage and you have the charm, but as soon as Zen Zhao sort of walks up to lane, you cannot really get away from that. So for the most part, I, I say that like the jungle 2v2 goes to a freak of freaks on that side of the map. There's almost nothing Graves can do on the top side very effectively. On the bottom side, obviously, you have way more openings for Cloud9, but let's take a look at Cloud9's champions. You have Aatrox, you have Graves, you have Lucian. What do all these champions do? Well, they have on-hit attack damage. This incentivizes the building of armor, specifically Ninja Tabby, and obviously Ninja Tabby aren't as absolutely disgusting as they used to be, but still not a fun time. On the right, you have Victor, Ryze, and Alistair, all champions that can build armor pretty effectively with their kits, especially considering that these top lane victors are going for the Iceborne Gauntlet builds. So to me, it's a little bit difficult. You get to a position where there's not a whole lot you can do. You're a bit reliant on getting Rift Herald. And you have to really effectively snowball because I really like the way that you can play out with Afrika. You have so much wave clear and zone control with Victor. And as Victor gets further onto the game, it's a lot more difficult to deal with him. It's a lot more difficult to deal with Kai'Sa. Even in bot lane, you have some all-in potential around level three with the Kai'Sa Alistair's and so. And of course, I have to talk about the, how the side lanes are going to just scale better for Afrika, regardless of whether they do a 3-1-1 or 1-3-1. So they have a lot of options going for them, which Cloud9 really don't. And then in a team fight scenario, it's just extremely difficult to do anything around the victor. As long as the victor is involved, you have short range carries on Cloud9 side, and it just gets really ugly unless you're snowballing. You have to sort of snowball through jungle because the lanes don't have the best setup ever. You obviously have charm and you have the engage from Braum if Lucian or Graves dash forward, but at the same time, you're mostly just going to be playing to chunk and either contest the scuttle crabs or deny blue buffs or deny jungle camps. And I think Cloud9 do all of this pretty well. And what I want to talk about, because there were a lot of moments in this game where it's just like, mm, yeah, nice, I'm nodding, good stuff. So uh, let's go. Start a little bit by talking about the initial path. A lot of junglers prefer blue side just because it's easy to get a super leash. Obviously, Svenskaren is starting without a leash on this side just so that the enemy team doesn't necessarily have the best idea of how he's going to path. Afrika have pretty good vision that will give them some idea of what Graves chooses to do, and C9 mostly just set up that ward in case they spot uh, Mowgli going for a really early scuttle contest. That's most likely not going to happen, but now, of course, if we can know that Sven Skarin is down there, they know that it's probably in their best interest to do a side trade. Sven Skarin also has a pretty good idea 
that Afrika will have information on his location. He wasn't super concerned with how he was controlling the movement of the scuttle crab with his auto attacks or anything like that, so he has a decent idea, which is why he doesn't just go for the side tray. He anticipates that Mowgli most likely will go for one as well. Mowgli does, he spotted on this ward, and he decides, okay, I'm going to maximize as many camps as possible to get this. And he goes up and he gets his wolves. If he's going to eat or, uh, excuse me, kill the wolves from Mowgli, then he has basically a lot of options because all of his camps on the spot side can't really necessarily be contested unless Mowgli goes through mid first. So as long as Jensen plays pretty well, his camps are going to be absolutely safe. Braum is a champion who's level one and level two is really, really disgusting. You absolutely do not want to contest this champion on this side of the map. Obviously the Lucian Braum is going to be very helpful to him. So he has a free option to go to Mowgli's blue buff whenever he wants because of the way that the terrain is put out. If Mowgli tries to jump onto the blue buff through the wall or whatever, he's basically a sitting duck. So uh, at this point, he's able to maximize sort of the amount of farm that he gets just by going back for that wolf camp instead of going directly and initiating the vertical jungle. This is where it gets a, a little bit dicey because you should know if you're <laughs> C9 at this point that Mowgli is most likely going to look for a mid lane play. This is this is based on what I said before, whereas like if you have Rise and is in Zao, obviously you're going to want the mid jungle control to happen in the skill ma matchup, and so getting a first blood for Kuro is really, really good for a Freakus comp. This is where, in my opinion, it gets a little bit interesting, because you have so much control on the top side. You have Licorice able to get a, a pretty decent back off of here, and you see Mowgli making an initiation on the bottom side of the map to make a play here. So there are a couple of questions that immediately come to mind when I see this. One is, why is Mowgli going bottom? And two is, why isn't Graves countering by going to the top side of the map? Let's talk about why these questions even come up. So obviously for Afrika, you see the fact that normally, until this part of the game, uh, Keen has been getting pretty good push. The kill potential here from Rise that we already discussed and we already saw play out, and then at the bottom side of the map, normally this is going to be an advantageous lane for C9, right? They're going to be the ones pushing up. So theoretically, you would think like here, okay, uh, Mowgli is sort of screwing up. He's not really playing to tempo. He's not playing to the side where he can get the most out of his ganks and get the most control out of his ganks. There is a big incentive for Mowgli to kind of relieve pressure here because you don't want to be in a position where bottom lane is getting a bad back because if enemy team gets a better back than bottom lane, then Braum can do a lot of damage to the control that you sort of set up on mid side. Obviously the all-in power from Kai'Sa and Alistair is really, really strong, which we covered already. So even though you're going against a Braum, there is something that you can definitely do. And if you do make that happen, you are completely limiting Graves' options. You're making it really difficult for him to contest this side of your jungle. You're making it really difficult for him to contest anything, anything at all that spawns on this map. Also, you know that even though perhaps Graves might have some control here, like they might not know for sure what C9's vision control is on that side. It's really difficult for Graves to do anything on this side. So here we have an option. You think, okay, there's there's some priority here from the RE. You can actually potentially invade on this side. And then if Mowgli is down here, you as Graves, instead of going here, move all the way up here and, and, and just take these camps take this camps, punish, punish him for just showing on this bottom side. Part of the reason why he doesn't do this is, let's say you're Victor, right? You you just had Licorice reset, so that's, that's good for you, but at the same time, you have so much control on this side. So if you're in here, you're doing camps, it's going to take you a little bit to clear this camp, so maybe you can just go out and run, but at the same time, you have Victor, who has ability to set down like gravity field or anything else that creates a really big zone. You have Rise that has an on-click stun, as we already mentioned. So if you get caught at all, if Ari is like leaning bot here like she is, or if Ari's not going to be able to back you up as much, like if, if you're basically invading solo with your mid laner and your top laner wants it back, there's it's really difficult for you to do anything. You how Svenskeren responds is pretty good. He invades on the bottom side of the map to put a ward on Mowgli's wolves because he sees Mowgli backing through the lane, probably will cross through his own jungle, 
perhaps do his bottom side camps and then head towards the top side. As soon as he gets information that Mowgli is headed towards top side, he can do something like take the dragon or make his own bottom side play. So it's it's setting up where he can make his next side play on the side of the map where he's strong rather than risking that he puts himself behind in a game where he really needs to snowball in contesting the top side camps. Now to kind of compare it to the last play, let's see what Svenskaren does when he is able to make a really effective trade on the other half of the map. Even though you know, Mowgli should be playing more to this top side, snowballing Keen ahead where he has an advantage, it's a lot easier for Svenskaren to punish him and get the advantage that he wants out of this. He has priority on the bot lane and then even Jensen is really able to play up in this lane right now just because of sort of the, the slow path to itemization with the tier stacking and everything for Rise that there is a big opportunity to set up the bottom side, look for when Scuttle is about to spawn and just make something happen. Obviously, Spence Garen gets a little bit too eager and gets snared under turret, outplayed a bit by Kuro. And, but this is ends up being actually, I think, a net game for C9 because they really need their Graves to snowball. Like their Graves really has to snowball and this is what they've been focusing on most of the game. You have him with so much CS up over Mowgli, a full level advantage up over Mowgli, and if Keen doesn't walk down here, he definitely gets the scuttle and it's really, really difficult for Afrika to make something happen through the jungle after this point. This is the part of the game where you can kind of see and really feel the, the clock that C9 are on to an extent because this is after the swap, this is after C9 have expended some tempo to secure the Rift Herald, which is very good for them because they're not going to be able to crack that mid lane turret without it. They've also secured this turret, but because of that, Keenine has the ability to push I said Keenine. Keen has the ability to push out, swap back up to the top side and set up for this play and make sure that they're looking to really kind of control this area of the map. I'm not 100% sure what they're even fighting about over here because Baron's not going to spawn for a while. You don't really have your red buff indicator up, so red buff is probably not even something you're fighting over. They're just kind of fighting over lane control, and C9 choose to initiate this TP for reasons unknown because obviously Keen now is going to have the TP advantage the entire time. C9 are looking to really, really sort of push their advantage on their bottom lane, but they're not even necessarily winning that because as soon as Licorice TPs and Kuro is able to get the snare on him and, and punish him, Ryze is, is doing well in the map. Mowgli can easily, Mowgli and uh, Keen can easily kite back in this little terrain area right here. Let's Let's just look at basically how this terrain is set up because you have the ability to lay down gravity field anyone who tries to walk through this brush like the fact that keen got charmed is actually super lucky for a c9 and, and him getting charmed is super unlucky for Frika. but that just tells you how devastating this fight could have been with keen's ult with anyone trying to get on top of him and mowgli able to sort of pressure him off of this because you see them losing to this duo just because he's pulled them into this choke and dropped his abilities on this. You also have Kuro, meanwhile, doing a ridiculous amount of damage on that side. Kramer just finished his first item, so he's at a pretty good spike overall because he isn't going for the Gwensos Rageblade build. And it, it's just... Uh, it's, Really, I'm not sure what C9 were thinking here exactly, but it, it gives you a good idea as to, to what C9 are really up against or what they want to sort of avoid. So for the life of me, I still don't really understand what C9 were playing for on the top side because I think it makes most sense, right? If you have Licorice, just kind of keep answering this pressure that was started by Keen when Keen rotates back up here so that they can move up into what they're doing now, which is using the Rift Herald and forcing other Freak of Freaks members to kind of go down here, and then they can continue pressuring their advantage up here because you're you're able to move up here and, and look for this siege. So you, you want to sort of play for here and then transfer this into here where you have your advantage and then hopefully get these two turrets off of the fact that you've dropped the Rift Herald and they have to answer it. That's super cool. Uh, this is what they're doing now, so, so I like that, but it doesn't exactly go to plan. Still, C9 do some good things in response. So here we go. We're, we're gonna 
drop our Rift Herald here against his pushing up top. There's not really any good vision control on this side. Afrika have so much good pinks over here, and uh, Jensen's really going to regret what he just did. So this really sort of stalls the play that C9 intended to make by kind of moving through there, up through there, getting vision, and then transferring pressure to this tier one turret because Jensen, again, is, is getting a bit eager and excited. So I think the overall, the moral of the story is this. Don't let your Ari get excited. She's not jinx. She's, she can't kill a turret and run away. No, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not how we like to play. But in response, you know, Afrika are able to kind of stall out. They're able to get control and rotate again to try to take their tier one turret of their own because Rise pushes this up. C9 have to rotate and answer the wave. <laughs> but, you know, that's fine. I think the mistake that Afrika make here is, is down to itemization. Let, let's take a look at this. <laughs> if you look at your items, you, you may notice one, one crucial detail, which is that Rise as uh, Mercury Strides and non Ninja Dabby. So he's going to be the only one on the top side of the map against Lucian and Graves. So you, you can <laughs> believe that Graves would go bottom because you, 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 obviously Licorice can't really defend this turret siege. And you have uh, Victor able to push out mid here. I, I think, honestly, though, like Afrika are not going to be pushing out as effectively. They're not going to be able to siege kind of all the way to C9's base at the same pace that you have a Graves and Lucian able to do. So as soon as they're aware that Graves and Lucian are here, they know that they can basically only take this one turret. So Afrika's objective is to take this one turret and then back and then go up here and defend this push. So they can they can do that because they're ahead of the tempo, but they can't really win an, a more extended trade where they're going for base turrets, etc. because of Graves and Lucian being a little bit better overall at, at killing these turrets. And also because obviously you have Ari answering mid, and even though Ari isn't going to do a whole lot versus Victor right here, she's at least going to be able to, to answer the push and then and make some headway if, if Victor goes all the way down. So overall, Vic Afrika's best play is, is secure this turret back, defend. But they leave Kuro, our, our friend Kuro, up here by himself, you know, the, the lonely rides on the island versus the Graves and the Lucian, and so the, the idea is like kind of clear what waves you can, don't die. But again, as I said, the problem is that it's his Merc Treads, he's probably thinking to himself when he's itemiz itemizing, I'm going to be matching Ari, right? I, I really want to match Ari in a side lane, probably up on top. We have Victor either mid to answer the dual lane if they're, they're pushing mid in the eventual set up there or we have Victor bottom because Victor obviously can 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 pretty much do well in either he's he's pretty safe from dives he's pretty safe from anything like that and he has really good wave clear so he can either side lane or he can be here they've had him matching Aatrox for a really long time because he's super far ahead and he can continuously punish the Aatrox and that's been going pretty well for them but obviously <laughs> if possible Victor is going to be way better off answering that. So his objective kind of here is is to probably push this out and also defend. So you, you're pulling a bunch of people with this play up to defend this uh, top tier two. Overall, if all C9 get is this top tier two and Afrika get this bottom tier two, that's actually way better for them because uh, as we've said before, when you're, when you're doing Baron and you have sidelaners, you're way happier being able to threaten base down here on this side, on the opposite side of the Baron, than you are being able to threaten base on this side. So overall, uh, would be good for Afrika if they, if they just back and defend up here. C9 can't do anything in this grouped fight scenario. They don't have a lot of tempo on the rest of the map and uh, they, they lose out. However, Kuro is um, a little bit unfortunate with his items and with how he plays this out. Yep, that's a that's a red buff for C9, so that's that's super cool, and that's a first tier one for Freak. So obviously, in this play, C9 still have to get this wave. They're pushing it out. They can push really fast, as I mentioned with the Graves and the Lucian. They'll be pushing a little bit faster. They'll be doing damage to turrets a little bit faster, and they just uh, go ahead and dive. So Keen tries to come and defend, 
but I think maybe Crow just didn't expect them to be bold. I don't I don't know. But he just he isn't itemized at all to defend against this and he isn't there in time. So they end up losing this, they lose all of that control, and it's good for them because there's wards in place and Baron's probably going to spawn soon, so they're able to sort of threaten all of that side of the map, especially if they get an advantage on this reset here and get some vision down. Off of that play, you have Lickers pushing all, all the way bot, and C9 are able to group and move to the bottom side of the map when blue buff is spawned, pick off Moogly there, and then just keep kind of moving to rotate towards where they know Afrika are going to be defending because Afrika are now behind kind of in the play. They're in a position where they they can send maybe one or two guys, but it's not going to be good for them. And if they do that, then they lose a player. And if they don't, then they lose a structure. So just these kind of movements around the map, making sure you're setting up terrain and getting picks in jungle on the opposite side of the map of where the victor is and in lane if, if victor is present, then you are playing this correctly as Graves and you are snowballing. Obviously, as with all these videos, nothing was perfect. Tons of mistakes by Afrika and a few mistakes by C9. I mentioned <laughs> Jensen a couple of times when I started making this video and putting the clips that I wanted to go over together. It's like, wow, this really kind of just looks like I'm flaming Jensen, but it, it was not intentional at all. But I think it's really important to highlight how fast and how smart some of Spencer Garrett's reactions were, the fact that he knew what side of the map he was strongest on. He didn't make the kinds of mistakes that you sort of expected from Spencer Garrett, especially after play. And I had a video that talked about how the jungle wasn't really in sync with the lanes at all. And you still see, to an extent, a little bit of that with Jensen, but it's it's really kind of Spencer Garrett taking charge, Spencer Garrett knowing where he needs to be, and Spencer Garrett leading C9 to victory in this game in particular.